Hello everyone, welcome to my review of Capcom Arcade Stadium. The reason why I've taken interest in this release is for one game's inclusion pretty much, which is Pro Gear. Up to this point, Pro Gear has not had an official console port. It has had a strange release on this Capcom Arcade Stick thing, which was basically running a bare bones version of the game on Final Burn Alpha. But other than that, Pro Gear hasn't seen an official console release. And as much as I do like to play it through unofficial emulation, like through MAME or through Shmup Arch personally, the issue that you run into is if you want to play Pro Gear in a Japanese event like Shmup Mania or STG Relay, or if you want to play it at something like GDQ, unfortunately these events do not allow for unofficial emulation. Shmup Slam does, but these events do not. And so in these cases, basically your only option is going to be playing this release. And so what I'm going to be hyper focusing in on in this video isn't so much, oh, what's included on the release, what's the value of these games, all that sort of thing. Instead, I'm going to be really digging into the question, how does this collection perform on a technical level? What features does it offer? How does it compare to unofficial emulation? How well can you access the game? Because I don't really think I need to convince my audience that Pro Gear is a good game. It is considered one of the best horizontal shmups ever made. Instead, the question is, does this release do Pro Gear justice? Can you play this game effectively? Or are you going to be hammering your head against the floor because of input lag or because of a lack of features? And so that's what I'm going to be looking at in this review. And I think this is an issue that you really run into right now when it comes to shmup reviews and with other publications like Nintendo Life or the various ones you'll find on Metacritic or whatever. The basic question they're always kind of asking is, are these games themselves good? And I think time has shown that most of these games are extremely good. And I think the real question that needs to be asked is, how well is this collection doing these games justice? Especially since a lot of these places don't like to acknowledge the existence of unofficial emulation. It's sort of the hidden boogeyman of the gaming press. And so with all that said, let us begin by taking a look at what Capcom was able to muster up. And a little bit of a spoiler before we get into it, I was pretty impressed with what Capcom has to offer and how much care and detail they have put into this release. So let us begin with one of the most simple and yet common mistakes that you see in these sorts of collections, which is the ROM selection, ROM availability. This is an issue that came up with the Mario 3D All-Stars release where they put the wrong ROM of Mario 64 on there, I think intentionally, Nonetheless, if you're a speedrunner, you can't really take advantage of that collection because they got rid of pretty much all the speed tech and the backward long jumps and all that sort of stuff. This happens a lot with shmup releases as well, where they will include stuff like only the international ROM or the English ROM, and they'll forget to include the Japanese ROM because they assume Americans or whoever won't have interest in the Japanese ROM. Luckily, Capcom has foreseen this issue and has not made it a problem because when you go to select the game, you can choose between the ROMs, either the Japanese or the English. Basically, you want to play on the Japanese ROM. That is the sort of competitive standard. Most people that I've seen play on the Japanese ROM, not the English ROM. I do think there are some pretty significant differences between the two, but I don't actually know them personally. But I do know that you want to play on the Japanese ROM, so shout out to Capcom for getting that right. Now let's take a look at the video options. Capcom got pretty creative here. Some of them are fun, but I don't think they're all that useful. For instance, you can have this sort of strange cab display, and it even sort of angles it to where you're looking up at the cab. This is nifty and kind of nice for thumbnails and that sort of thing, but I can't see myself sitting down and playing on this that way. I think this is just kind of a cool little swaggy feature they include. Some of them are a little bit better, like one of them you can get a little bit closer in, but overall I think this is more decorative or for art or for just cool factor than really being practical but of course you can go in and just get an original 4x3 or you can get a 16x9 when it comes to shmups I do not recommend switching them over to 16x9 because while it is nice to have that extra screen real estate the issue is that you're now changing the aspect ratio and so your movement's going to be off you're going to accelerate horizontally faster than you're supposed to and you're going to accelerate vertically slower than you're supposed to. It can throw off your timing, it can throw off your dodging, it can throw off how you read the bullets. So stick with the original aspect ratio 4x3. You can also do, I guess, an arcade perfect aspect ratio. My issue with this is that it is zoomed out and I think 4x3 is close enough. So I personally play in 4x3. I guess if you had an arcade monitor or if you had some kind of fancy 
monitor that can zoom in on this area without introducing lag or doing weird stuff. I guess that would be pretty cool, but I personally play in 4x3. It also has some nice display filters, so a good scanline option. I think having nice scan lines should be sort of a basic requirement for people doing shmup releases. I think they do a good job here. And they also have this cool little CRT bezel that I like. It kind of crops the screen and stretches it just a little bit to emulate how a CRT looks. Again, I think this is pretty cool. Not necessarily something you want to play with all the time probably, but it is a nice little feature that I liked added. And one thing that I just like about all these different video options is that it shows that Capcom is taking its time is adding in cool little stuff like it may not seem like a big deal to have a selection of wallpapers and I think a lot of shmup releases these days are pretty bare bones even M2 this is a problem with the M2 releases is that they have one or two wallpapers at most I like what Capcom did here and they added in a bunch of different wallpapers my favorite being this sort of detailed Capcom one that you'll see throughout the video or the cow one which reminds me of Harvest Moon I like this inclusion good job with the wallpapers and stuff like that but let's get into the nitty gritty stuff. This is all sort of stuff outside of the aspect ratio, which is pretty much just added content, but isn't gonna make or break release. But now we're gonna start getting into the stuff that I think can make or break a lot of shmup releases. So the first one is they included a scoreboard. I think that is really cool. I don't know how well this is going to be curated or if Capcom's gonna keep an eye out for cheated runs and that sort of thing. From what I understand, the Ikaruga scoreboard recently purged a bunch of cheated runs, so it's not an impossibility, but I do think overall that's a very cool inclusion. I'm not sure if it's going to have like downloadable replays. I don't think it will because from playing locally, I didn't find any sort of replay option. I didn't go online because I don't go online with my Switch because Nintendo will get mad at me because I have other stuff on my Switch that they might get mad about, which will come up here in a second. As far as the control options go, I think they did a good job here. Getting Rapid Shot in there, of course, is pretty fundamental. Again, putting a sort of boot on this argument that Rapid is cheating. Now you're getting a bunch of official releases where Rapid is included. So I think the excuses for people not being allowed to use Turbo or Rapid are getting thinner and thinner. I have a whole video about this, but that's really cool. The big thing that stood out to me, though, was the Fast Forward button. I've never seen this re included in an official release before, and it makes me very happy to see it included. Whenever I play on RetroArch or ShmupArch or MAME, I always use Fast Forward to get through the loading screens, to get through the stage transitions, or sometimes if there's a bunch of dead air in the stage design, I'll fast forward through it. I think that is very cool that they included this, and I hope M2 and other Shmup releases take this into stride because I do think the inclusion of a Fast Forward button is next level and something I'm very happy to see. Along with that, they have a Rewind button at first, I wasn't sure what to think about the rewind button. This isn't something I normally use. I typically just use load states and save states. However, it definitely grew on me. And I do think rewind is a really nifty feature to have. Because if you're going through and you're just trying to learn the stages, usually you have to make save states in advance, right? But with rewind, what you could do is you could, okay, let's say you find a tough section, you take a hit, you could rewind, and then you can make a save state where your rewind ends, and then you could save state load from there. Unfortunately, there is no load state button. I think that is an oversight. But the good news is, is that they at least have a save state feature. They have 32 slots. I don't know why all these developers are doing 32 slots. It's just kind of funny because I think M2 does 32 as well. Maybe there's some deeper reason for it, but I think it's just because they feel like adding 32 slots. My one criticism of this save state feature is that it is kind of slow and it has some unnecessary menuing involved. I mean, it's better than nothing, but I do think it could be streamlined down to a button like M2 does. But still, very cool to have that included. And I do want to make a little bit of a spiel here for people who may not have seen my content before. I think there is a little bit of misunderstanding when people see stuff like rewind, fast forward, and save states. And they say, oh, these are options that only scrubs or crappy players care about. Real players don't care about that. Real players just play without any of these sorts of features and do full runs all the time. That actually isn't true. Really hardcore players, people who are invested in the genre, care about these features a lot because they basically cut down a lot of redundant gameplay and allow you to hyper-focus when you're training. I don't think people understand that whenever people who are learning these games are practicing them, they aren't just sitting there and doing full runs the entire time. I mean, some people old school do that. But for the most part, what people do now is that they will go ahead and start the credit and they'll use save states and rewind and all these sorts of features 
to learn the game more quickly and more effectively, which I think is very good. And then when you go to do your full runs, then of course you don't use these features. But when you're practicing, I think these features are incredibly important. And I do consider ports that don't include them these days pretty incomplete. And so I'm really happy Capcom went ahead and introduced these. I don't know if they had veteran players in mind when they did. They may have thought they might have been more useful for newer players, but I think they're good for all players of all skill levels. So please, let's end these memes of people saying that rewind or save states are bad. They are not, and they should be included in all shmup releases moving forward. There's my little spiel on that. Let's talk about the real kicker here, the, probably the real reason you're tuning into this video, which is the question of the input lag. So the first thing that needs to be understood before we get into the input lag readings of this game specifically, is that input lag readings on the Nintendo Switch are a complicated beast. At this point, I really don't like doing them all that much unless it's necessary like in this case because it is so hard to pinpoint where these sources of lags are coming from and it's also very difficult to standardize it across different setups. So you could have two different people doing very good jobs at measuring the lag, but they could come out with slightly different results just based on the equipment they're using, what controllers they have, all that sort of stuff. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give my readings, but what I'm also going to do is I'm going to give comparative readings with the same setup so that even if people come up with different readings overall, you're going to be able to scale my results along with theirs, if that makes sense, right? So let's move on to discussing my setup because this is actually very important. I'm using the Hori Universal board and I'm plugging it directly into the dock, into the switch. Previous testing has found that using wireless seems to be faster and I have a wireless setup that I did with another board and all that sort of thing. Interestingly enough though, when I went to compare this to the wireless, I found that the wireless was no longer giving an advantage and I do not know why this is. I do not know if there's been an update to the switch to now the dock is less laggy or if there's been an issue with my own setup, my own wireless setup to where now it is getting laggier over time which wouldn't surprise me all that much because it's got a lot of voltages and wires and pad hacking going on and also wireless just isn't that reliable of an input method anyway. So nonetheless, I've decided to choose to use my wired setup, especially since this is something that I can carry across to both my PS4 and PC, which I'm going to do comparative tests for. And also the display I'm using is a lagless CRT. Recently, I did a video where I found an HDMI to VGA converter that adds no input lag. So this is going to be a very solid display performance because it is a lagless CRT. So there is no need to check to see what my monitor is and minus out my monitor lag and all that sort of stuff. So I, that I'm very happy about. So let's begin with the basic reading. So this game came out to five frames of input lag, which isn't all that great. Normally I want to see a three or a four at the most. Five is getting on the upper end. However, the issue is that this is on the Nintendo Switch, which is a laggy console. And so I don't know how much we can blame the release itself. If it's something like the Psycho Collection where it's at 7 or 8 frames, there you can be like, okay, there was an issue with this release. 5 frames, it isn't great. However, what I went ahead and did is I compared it to other releases on the Switch to see what they came out as and to see is it just this release or is this an underlying issue with the Switch itself. So I tested Esperade and I also got 5 frames. So again, M2 usually do a really good job at getting their input lag low on consoles. And so Esperade is five frames. And then I went ahead and tested Esperade on the PS4. This was interesting. Esperade on the PS4 is three frames. So, and that is a good reading. Basically what this is kind of showing me is that the Switch itself is introducing extra lag that isn't necessarily tied into the game itself. I double checked this with Blazing Star. So on the Switch, Blazing Star is also five frames. Then I checked it on the PS4. It is four frames. I think it's a little bit of a laggy release on the PS4. I was hoping for a three, but still the same release across the platforms. There's going to be more input lag on the Switch. And then this next test is where it gets really interesting. So I thought, okay, so Pro Gear on the Switch, five frames, that's not all that great. It's not unplayable or anything, but it's, it's getting to the point where I don't really like to see that. So I went ahead and tested Pro Gear on the Switch using RetroArch. So it turns out you actually can play Pro Gear on the Switch using means that Nintendo is not that fond of to say the release. And you can use what's called Run Ahead, 
to get the frame advance down to one frame, which I went ahead and did. So basically this is saying that the game is going to respond in one frame. That is guaranteed. But how much does the Switch itself add? Well, it turns out that the Switch itself adds two extra frames of lag on top of this, coming out to three frames. So this is basically saying that no matter what you do, no matter how well you program your game, the lowest reading you are going to get on the Nintendo Switch for input lag is three frames, at least from what I can gather here. If people have contrary evidence, I'd love to see it, but that is the lowest reading I've ever seen on the Nintendo Switch. And again, this is using something that is guaranteed to respond in one frame. So I thought, okay, now we have Pro Gear on the Capcom release at five frames. We have Pro Gear on the RetroArch version on the Switch at three frames. Now let's take a look at how Pro Gear reacts on Shmup Arch on the PC, just to give a little comparison here. It responds with the same settings in one frame. So essentially, the Nintendo Switch itself is adding two frames of input lag or round two frames of input lag. Where that's coming from is hard to say. Is it coming from the dock? Is it coming from the V-Sync? Where is that coming from? That is something I have to yet decide. But basically, the take home message of all this lag testing, the thing I want to emphasize is that I don't think you can necessarily fault the Capcom all that much. Five frames isn't that good. I wouldn't be that excited to run this game live with five frames. However, there is a light of hope, which is if they re-release this thing on the PS4, it'll probably come out to three to four frames, which would be much more playable in my opinion. Again, I know a lot of people really don't care about the input lag and you'll play it with five frames with a smile on your face. And that's perfectly fine with me, but I just wanted to get the information to you, put the information in your hands. I'm not super happy about it, but it's also not unplayable. You know, it's kind of on that borderline. Nonetheless, this is a very solid release and probably the best port of Pro Gear we're going to see in a very long time unless it gets the M2 treatment. But I am very impressed with the amount of effort and time Capcom put into this. This isn't like the Psycho Collection where they just threw ROMs on the Switch and said, have at it. You know what I mean? And so I do think it is kind of funny that in the end, a lot of the reviewers will look at this release and sort of just give it equivalent scores to the Psycho Collection, where I think this thing is head and shoulders much better of it. And so one last thing, if you want to get a really in-depth, detailed breakdown of this release, of all the games included, their history, their performance, I mean the whole enchilada, go ahead and check out Shmup Junkie's video tomorrow coming out. I'm hearing it's going to be a very long video, or nearly an hour, so maybe if you don't want to watch the video on YouTube, just order the Blu-ray at this point. I'm really looking forward to it. Shoutouts to Shmup Junkie, and also shoutouts to the patrons. Adios, everyone. So thank you to 72 PCT Water, Adam Pearson, Adrian Reyes, Ukshay Wadker, Dingo, Handicap, Anthony A, Ben, Ben Wynn, Borgi22, Brian Reboot, Brian Shiver, Corio, Danielle Savage, Delta Tango 6, Disco Star Slayer, Dominic NG, Eric H, Full Set, Retro Shmupper, Geriatric, Don Maku, Hausu, Ilya, Kiwi, JLab, JBRPG, Joe Angelo, Game Boy Guru, K, Malaise, Mark Toms, Maz, Meher Klendrian, Minong, Queen Charlene, Nathaniel Davis, N Electron, Nine, Okla Kugels, Philip Mason, Portal 63, Ram Q, Raul, Real Skeen, Sketchy Raccoon, The Boot Rex, TRM, Sugumo, Plasmo, Yishi, and Utakaya. Thanks for watching.